Uh, good morning. Happy Tuesday. Um, this morning, um, we find ourselves in um, what is traditionally accepted as the, uh, the, the last week of Jesus' life and ministry, um, earthly life, shall we say, um, with uh, this last Sunday being uh, Palm Sunday, uh, beginning of the last week of, of, of this uh, this part of, of Jesus' life and work. Um, I, I have uh, John 19 this morning. And uh, if you heard Ed's devotion yesterday, he talked some about Pilate and, and about uh, these same couple of chapters here, John 18 and 19. And uh, I'm mostly going to read John 19 today. And what I, what I want you to notice, and, and you can check out the other Gospels as well, but there are no real emotional statements that are made. Uh, no statements about, you know, a, a poor, pathetic treatment of Jesus, you know, uh, no, no anger, no sadness. Um, as, uh, as they used to say in uh, uh, Dragnet, just, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And uh, the gospel writers give us a, a pretty clear picture of Jesus submitting himself to the trials and going through what he had to go through uh, to, uh, to, to get to the cross, to get to the grave, to, to get to the empty tomb. And so as much as at the end of chapter 19, we'll see what can amount to a great sadness for us, that's not the end. Um, as, uh, and I don't know if Tony Campalo started this, but he had a great message years ago where he said, uh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And uh, so anyways, let's take a look at John chapter 19 and, uh, and uh, maybe make a few comments. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis of, of, for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. All right, there's some emotion there. Uh, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you have no power or you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgments uh, on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, 
one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign uh, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus uh, stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciples took her into his, or the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the spun, sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been cruci excuse me, crucified with Jesus and then of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, uh, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it uh, has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may believe. The things happen so that these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, uh, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, taking Jesus' body the two of them wrapped it uh, with its spices uh, in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had, been, had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Some time ago, Sharon and I, were able to make a trip to Jerusalem, uh, to, to Israel. And uh, I, I'm kind of cautious to talk too much about the experience because a lot of people aren't able to get to, get to Israel. And it's not essential uh, for a Christian to go there. It's not like a pilgrimage where if you don't go, you don't have the right experience or anything like that. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, as I read this scripture, I think about being in an area that is one possible place where Jesus went through his trials. Uh, the, the Antonia was a, a palace. It's possibly the place where Pilate lived. Uh, there, there's also a possibility that he lived in Herod's palace uh, in a little bit different place in Jerusalem. But when we were in that particular place, they had excavated down to a floor that was uh, obviously had been uh, outside uh, at one time because there were grooves there in the pavement. 
uh, like, you know, if there was rain, that, that the rain would kind of funnel away and uh, horses would not slip on the wet stone uh, by, that way. Um, there were carvings in the pavement that, that seemed to, to, to relate back to what Jesus experienced. And, uh, you know, it's likely that Jesus was the only one that they ever put a crown of thorns and a purple robe on, although there might have been others, uh, probably many others who were mocked in different ways. Uh, this was a very harsh detail that the Roman soldiers had, um, execution detail, you know, being there for trials and, you know, dealing with all kinds of different people and situations and whatever. Um, being out in a, in a garden area uh, after that, an area that it was obviously a garden because there was a Oh, kind of an, an area that was a collection point where maybe uh, grapes or olives would have been put in and, and stomped out. A place that would collect the juice that would flow out of these uh, these fruits. I guess olives considered a fruit. Uh, in one direction from the garden, you could see a place that that had a cliff face that was was definitely a looked like a skull where uh, pock marks were in the hill. It's likely that Jesus was crucified on the flat land in front of the hill. Although uh, the hymn writer says on a hill far away, the Bible doesn't specify a hill. It's kind of more of a, a tradition that people who came later felt was, was more likely. Um, the Romans were pretty practical. It was probably on the flat land. It may have been there, it may, may not have been. Um, when you went to the other side of the garden, there was a place that uh, obviously had been a tomb or some such room that was carved out uh, of the stone there. And uh, in front of that is kind of a trench where a stone could have rolled uh, in or out of the way of the opening. Uh, a couple places inside where it looked like a body could be laid very easily. Now, were any of these places where Jesus was at that time, especially during this, this last uh, few hours and, and uh, in, of this experience? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, God seems to have a way of, of protecting us from having things that we will worship. And so we don't have the exact place where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Um, Again, some have established by tradition where they think it was and where they can collect money or worship or whatever. Um, what I see is, is the scripture that can be visualized. And, and that's maybe the best thing about being in these areas. But you can go to the internet, you can look these places up and see. Um, you can uh, you know, buy books. Uh, we, we bought a couple books while we were there and have wonderful pictures. And mostly uh, in, in our hearts and minds to just kind of live with Jesus, kind of be, be like John, who was there with Mary, Mary's sister, Mary Magdalene, and, and just to, to recognize that if we were following the crowd, we would have been helpless to stop what was happening. And you know, it's a good thing that nobody tried to stop it. Uh, it had John jumped up and tried to stop or, or Mary, they might've been hurt or killed. And had we stopped Jesus from going to the cross, um, and, and that, that couldn't happen. It was part of prophecy and such. But anyways, um, we, just, we just need to live in that moment and to recognize what Jesus did for us and because of us. And then to know that, that by his love, he went to the cross and by the power of God, he came out of the tomb. And so, you know, later this week, it'll be Friday, but Sunday's coming. Father God, I thank you for this day, this Tuesday, this day that we celebrate life and we have the opportunity to, to share uh, what we've experienced in Jesus, the opportunity to, to look to your word and to, to see some of the historical things and to know that Jesus did what he did for us. Thank you for him. Thank you for your love and power and for bringing Jesus to us. In his name we pray, amen.
Have a great Tuesday.